educate and steer the public in, in ways we think might best balance the, the community's environmental, economic, and just people concerns. In 2006, the Salmon Valley Stewardship helped coordinate the newly formed Lemhi County Forest Restoration Group. Since then, through huge collaborative efforts, that group has accomplished forest restoration on a total of 13,000 acres. An additional 40,000 acres of restoration is planned for the future. The Idaho Department of Fish and Game is another important part in the local mix of partnerships since it deals with species that dwell on private, state, and federal lands. The Salmon Regional Supervisor in 2004 was Jim Lukens. The management of the uh, of, of BLM range and the forest directly affects uh, fish and wildlife habitat. If the habitat is in poor condition, and the fish and game assumes a lot of that re re um, responsibility for poor condition, uh, um, and we have to uh, face our constituents, our license buyers. We're working very, very hard in uh, local cooperative efforts with landowners, ranchers, um, various other agency biologists and so forth to try and prevent the listing of sage grouse. And we think that the only way we're going to be successful in doing that is have some uh, broad uh, improvements in, in habitat. Another very beneficial local cooperative group was made possible by congressional legislation. The Resource Advisory Committee was established under the authority of the Secure Rural Schools and Community Self-Determination Act. Part of those monies are set aside by the counties and reserved for the Resource Advisory Committee to use them for resource projects on national forest system lands or, the, or they can be on private lands if those projects would benefit the, the resources on the National Forest. The Resource Advisory Committee, better known as RAC, was made up of 15 individuals that represented resource user groups, commercial interests, environmental groups, historical groups, and local community leaders. They sit down, work together, uh, look at various resource projects that can be uh, used on the, on the National Forest lands in areas of resource protection, watershed protection, and, uh, re and development, and also on uh, just a number of projects. In its 11-year lifetime, in addition to providing money for schools and roads, the Secure Rural Schools Act contributed over $4.5 million to local projects which greatly improved the health of local ecosystems and put young people to work on the lands and in the forests. In 2004, through cooperative efforts, residents of Lemhi County took the lead in efforts to lessen the wildland fire threats that had been identified as the biggest threat to this area's safety. With the financial assistance of the Bureau of Land Management, the county employed Janet Nelson as Emergency Services Coordinator. After three years' work, with the help of all entities involved, a countywide all-hazard mitigation plan was developed. We formulated a working group which consists of the Forest Service, BLM, uh, all the county fire departments, their representatives, emergency services, my office, which is emergency coordinator position, uh, wildland urban interface, um, various citizen groups, the subdivision group from uh, Sunset Heights, also the Gibbonsville sub subdivision group. We got together and we identified areas and identified what we needed to do to mitigate. And mitigating is basically being prepared for that disaster, which are wildland. That's what we're doing here. We're being prepared and making defendable spaces around the homes. Um, so we got together and we, we did this, this uh, plan. We identified projects, we identified high threat areas, and every year we update it through our working group to get new projects. And we are very active in what's going on in the community. Thick stands of beetle-infested pine trees are a threat to homes surrounding Williams Lake, located 15 miles south of Salmon. The high-risk area was one of the first to benefit from an early fuels reduction program. 
through the WUI program, which is the Wildland Urban Interface program, we started doing fuels reduction on the private property where the BLM started doing a fuels reduction pro project on the BLM property. So if there is a threat of wildfire, we do have a wildfire, we have a better chance of uh, surviving uh, survivable space because we've done reductions on both areas, both the private and on the uh, public lands. In 2004, Jim Tucker was fire use specialist for the Salmon BLM field office. He was involved in the Williams Lake project that encompassed about 250 acres. Uh, Williams Lake was one of them that was identified and so we did a, a hazardous fuels reduction project in forest health directly south of the houses there on the lake. So anything eight inches or less was removed with what was called a slash buster. It was a large piece of machinery that uh, basically grinds up trees and scatters it uniformly across the ground. And so uh, you have fewer trees per acre. There's still you know, potential up there for a fire, but it's uh, hopefully going to be more manageable. I think uh, what we've done up there, right directly behind the houses, is beneficial. I think the fact that the uh, private property owners are now also doing uh, parts on, on their private property, uh, it's going to help. When Doctor of Chemistry Norman Miller and his wife Pauline retired to their mountain home north of Salmon in 1994, running from forest fires was not part of the plan. They kept getting closer though. Last year, the um uh, fire up on the um, mountain between um, Missoula, between uh, Montana and Idaho uh, was only four miles away and then uh, Gibbonsville is three miles from us. Uh, so it got our attention. To protect their property, the Millers have installed their own fire suppression sprinkler Pretty. system. Which is what we have to do. Which is what we have to do. Did you ever dream that you would be getting into this? No, but you're here and you have to do something. Now, the circumstances so we'll take your heat and do something. We'll do what you can. In 2005, Idaho seized an opportunity for its counties to have a say about management of inventoried roadless areas. Through the efforts of Lemhi County, some of the local designated roadless areas of great concern are now allowed to be more actively managed. Salmon Chalice North Fork District Ranger Russ Bacon explains the difference those new parameters have made to the city's Jesse Creek watershed. It's allowed um, us to, uh, to now start moving forward on generating a proposal to, uh, for some active management in the watershed. That's, uh, we've been um, just just starting to engage the collaborative on that project in the last six months. Um, we, uh, we expect um, lots of time kicking, uh, kicking pine needles in, the, in, the, uh, in that watershed this uh, summer with an expectation that it's going to take us at least another year to get through that project and get through NEPA, probably looking at a decision on a project like that in 2014. Another area freed for possible fuel reduction is around Bob Wilson's Moose Creek Estates. It is included in the proposed 41,000-acre Upper North Fork project the Lemhi County Forest Restoration Collaborative has worked on for three years. It's a big project. It's taken a lot of energy, and it's going to continue to take a lot of energy, but we're hoping for a decision so we can start uh, doing work in those high-priority areas in 2013. The reason all fuel reduction proposals take so much time and energy is the gauntlet of roadblocks that exist between concept and implementation. Negotiating the path through meeting all federal regulations and environmental activist legal challenges can take years. Jake Krylik is with the National Forest Protection Alliance in Missoula, Montana. In 2004, he shared the organization's philosophy on forest management. We were formed with the mission of ending industrial exploitation of our federal public lands. Our national forest is an issue that does not get a lot of attention, but uh, a major reason why we took the position of ending the commercial logging program and getting the, the Forest Service basically out of the timber business is because we feel that um, they operate under a very conflicting um, mission, uh, very conflicting policies. Um, how can we on the one hand continue to cut down 
our highest conservation value forests, um, and on the other hand, say that we need to restore um, areas that um, were previously cut. You know, to us, it doesn't make sense that we're never going to be able to get ahead of the curve. Well, the wood would grow back faster in one third of this forest on small diameter, just thin in the wood, than this mill would saw for the rest of the, for the next hundred years. What the biggest tree that we would saw would be 14 inches. Most of our trees would be between four and eight inches. The total estimated growth on that forest is 100 million board feet per year. So even if we were to harvest the total allowable sales quantity, which we never come close to, we'd still be building up 72 million board feet of lumber per year on this forest. As it is, for the last year we've harvested nothing. The result of which is our industries are hurting for material, we're getting tremendous fuel buildup on the forest, and we're in a bad fire hazard situation because we're not removing anything as product. And I, I feel like, as an individual, that we need to look at the process and either allow the people who are educated, who are trained in managing of these resources to do so, and if we don't allow them to do that, then we can just do away with the Forest Service and let it be managed by the special interest groups. Our reality is that um, much of the national forest system has already been developed, um, has been overmanaged, if you will, uh, and it's producing a lot of the problems that um, are creating, for, for example, um, you know, hotter fires, you know, bigger fires, um, is coming from the, a lot of the fuel that's left from the logging operation. Um, most of the logging that we see, we would not call it selective. Um, we would call it, um, you know, one or two phase clear cutting. Um, and on most of the areas around here on the Salmon Chalice, uh, we don't see selective cutting. We see clear cutting. Um, where I, you know, where I am, you know, from in the Missoula area, um, there has been uh, I think efforts by the Forest Service to do um, some selective cutting, but generally um, we find that the forest practices being employed um, are really, um, you know, are not appropriate for um, the lands and for the forests um, where they're, you know, where they're being practiced. So when we go back and look at where we've thinned, it's like a park. It's, we leave the woods better than we left it. We don't go and clear cut it. And we don't leave fuel on the ground. We pull the fuel back. We are operating under the assumption that we have to make uh, this work for all 280 million Americans um, and not just for narrow special interests that obviously profit very greatly, you know, from um, the production of public resources. Again, that's a lot of where I think the, you know, the, um, the philosophical divide exists, you know, for us. The forest will be touched. If it's not touched by industry, it will be touched by catastrophic fire. This is one of those situations where you really need to be careful what you wish for. If we think that the hand of man is destructive to the forest, so brother, you ain't seen nothing yet. Wait till Mother Nature gets done with her. A very literal roadblock to forest health management is the ongoing debate over roads. Uh, we have far too many roads that the government can't maintain. Um, something like a $10 billion maintenance backlog on Forest Service roads in this country. You know, we're, we're not going to be able to restore uh, or maintain um, all of those places if we keep building roads uh, to access the timber. They're not only important for the management of the forest so that they can get to it, it's the, the roads are a fire barrier. They, they allow it so that, the, um, uh, so that we can control noxious weeds. Um, they uh, allow for the recreation. And it allows for emergency services to be uh, provided in the areas when people get lost, planes go down, whatever the situation is. Absolutely vital. You cannot manage territory that you can't access. And without access to the public lands, for all practical purposes, those public lands do not exist. We want to keep those roads open. Uh, there's been some talk about obliterating some roads. I think we need to look at that as, in a, uh, as uh, how that affects emergency services and our visitors when people come into our valley to recreate or whatever they do and they get into trouble. 
uh, we need to be able to access them. In some cases, forest roads are not just closed by means of the gate. They are obliterated, as Commissioners Cope and Prox documented in 2004. It takes a lot of equipment. I know that uh, it uh, really tears up the, 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 um, the land, the road area, the forest. I mean, when you pull up the cut and then pull down the uh, bank above, and leave that in a, in a looks like a war zone, pulling over some of the uh, new uh, live trees and dead trees and trying to make it look like um, a natural area. Then you've disturbed the ground again. You have the weed problem. You have no access. You have no fire barrier. You have no way to access for management. You have no way to fuels reduce. You have no ways for uh, uh, managing, managing of the grazing that has taken place on some of the lands. If a road does need to be removed, perhaps private industry has a better idea? The first road reclamation in the whole United States was done right here as we speak, right up to my left of my hand here of six miles of some heavy timber. It was documented by the Forest Service. They come in and studied it. And the people that didn't know that there was ever a road there could not see the six miles of road we put in. So there again, these are issues that are, that are not used. We have the tools, we have the technology. Why can't we use them? As residents of Lemhi County, Idaho, struggle along with the rest of the country in current economic conditions, locals can't understand why salvageable fire and beetle-killed timber is being left to rot. So we feel like an economy that we're, everyone's concerned about, national economy, a resource, a local resource, is an added value to our, our national uh, GNP, the health of our economy in our, in our country. I don't believe that our national forests um, should be providing, you know, that, that cheap wood source to the American public anymore because I think the values associated with the clean air, the clean water, uh, the biodiversity, you know, all of the things that the American public gets from the national forests, um, the recreation, you know, the wilderness opportunities, those things are far more valuable than the timber value. Well, right now we're importing a tremendous amount of wood out of Canada and the Canadians love us for it. It makes no sense to me to import a resource such as wood and lumber which is in such incredible demand if you look at the construction industry nationwide. Why in the world would we buy lumber from someone else and then burn up our own? I have trouble understanding that philosophy. I would say some of the frustrations as a commissioner are seeing all of our natural resources around us and people that I know need jobs and are, would be willing to, to utilize our natural resources, our timber and things, not being able to. That is, that is quite a frustrating thing I think that we're trying to, trying to work on, uh, trying to, to see what we can do to relax some some of our uh, restrictions. What's important is our timber industry is hurting so bad that when you wipe, when the timber industry is wiped out, there will no longer be people to manage the forest. And that technology just doesn't come back overnight. It's like our farmers, it needs to be protected and there's really not, not been anything put into play to, to do that. So I see that as a lot. I've seen that the, the people that can manage the forest is getting very far and few between, which is scary because who wants to, to be in an industry that you're just going backwards all the time. The other issue is the more we drag this around in courts and the more that we just keep stopping it, we will eventually just kill the horse that is, that is pulling the wagon and there won't be nothing left. And that's what we feel we're at. We're, we're ready to hang it up and to look for an area that we can work. Those are natural resources and natural resource production creates the only real wealth. Everything else spins off that. And rural Idaho, of course, is part of rural America. You don't have a strong economy or a good standard of living without production. And for to get all kinds of production, you have to use your natural resources. And this is what we have been deprived of over the years, for probably the last 30, going on 40 years, just slowly and methodically. The community and the workforce is a huge part of 
the forest restoration principles and criteria. It's not all just about the ecology. Uh, it very much is about the economics and about you know how communities and that workforce interact. Um, and so. I think in terms of some of the byproducts, you know, where again, the need is about reducing fuels and about restoring forests. If there's some byproducts that come off of that, then I think we're feeling that that's okay, that that can be sold. Uh, but if it's just a clear green timber sale that's designed to bring wood to the mill, um, we're not going to support those type of projects. Important for us to realize that Jake's, Jake Krylik's remarks here were recorded in 2004. In the time since then, Jake has become involved in Lemhi County as part of our Lemhi Forest Collaborative Group and has become very much more knowledgeable of the on-the-ground effects that our forest management has and has not had. The difference in the attitude people get, and Jake's one of them, once they're here on the ground and see what the forest is really like and see how the community works, those attitudes change pretty dramatically. And Jake's has, Jake's been really good to work with. Unfortunately, we have a lot of people out there who, unlike Jake, have not visited our community, have not seen our forests, and don't grasp the concepts that we have of active management for the improvement of our community and our economy. We really wish we could get more people like Jake to come over and work with us and change those attitudes.